Good morning, everybody. Does that sound better? Great. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Um, I am so excited this morning to introduce Phil McMillan, who you probably already know, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him. First of all, something that I learned this week, the last I, as he says, is just hanging out and having fun. So even though it looks like McMillian, it's McMillan. So um, he is a treasure within our congregation and one that we have been so excited to um, have share his wealth of knowledge with us at Holy Communion. And um, I'm just so glad that we are at this day at last. Um, Phil received his Bachelor of Science and Masters of Divinity from Abilene Christian University. He completed the MA and PhD in Old Testament at Vanderbilt and studied at Free University in West Berlin. He's presented papers at national meetings, he has published articles, and he has published in the Transforming Word. He participated in an archaeological dig about 20 miles outside of Jerusalem. He and his family spent a summer at the Tantor Theological Study Center in Bethlehem, and he has taught archaeological tours of the Bible lands. That's something I want to go on sometime. Um, Phil has served as a campus minister at Eastern New Mexico University and at Boise State University, He's preached at various churches. He has taught on college lectureships at Pepperdine, Columbia Christian College, and Harding University. And he was professor of Old Testament most recently at Harding School of Theology right here in Memphis until 2013. So that is an impressive list to have among us. And I'm so excited for him to share all that he knows about art and theology, and to get us started today on that. I want to open us with the words of a presiding bishop, Frank Griswold. And he says, the Holy Spirit speaks many languages, among them the language of art in all its forms. As Christians, we are people of incarnation, and therefore prepared to encounter the divine mystery in ways that engage our senses. Without further ado, come on up, Phil McMillan. Thank you, Hester. I appreciate that very kind introduction. We may be a little bit loud. Does it sound loud to you, or is that about right? Okay, great. I love that quote that you shared with us. I think that is such a perfect introduction to the way art can enrich and inform our faith. And that's one of the things I want us to think about. As, uh, as Hester mentioned in the introduction, my primary background and training is in biblical studies and especially in Old Testament. But my first wife, who passed away in 2009, was an artist and a painter. And we spent many, many hours in museums uh, in this country and in Europe uh, seeing great masterpieces. And just so I could understand that a little better, I took uh, a one-year class in art history uh, just for my own enrichment. And then since I have retired from uh, full-time teaching, I've been volunteering as a docent at the Dixon Gallery and Gardens here in Memphis, and I've learned even more about art and uh, some of the various exhibitions that they've had there. One of the things that I've been surprised by at the Dixon is occasionally they'll have an exhibition and I hear about it coming and I think, that doesn't sound very good to me. And when it gets here and I learn about it, I'm always amazed at how wonderful it is and how much there is to know about each one. So uh, that's been a very pleasant surprise. Some of you may remember that a few weeks ago when Sandy was talking about our worship space, one of the things he mentioned is that the church over the centuries has been a sanctuary 
for art. The church, especially in, in the Middle Ages and in the Reformation, the church supported art. Uh, much of the art was funded by churches and was presented in churches in uh, beautiful cathedrals. And some of you have probably visited some of those. You see the artwork that is uh, done there to, to uh, enrich those spaces. Art illustrated stories from the Bible. And sometimes those illustrations were really the only Bible that some people had. In the Middle Ages, written Bibles were extremely expensive. Before the printing press, they had to be copied by hand and were terribly expensive. So most people could not afford a written Bible. And even if they could, many people could not read. I've read various estimates about the literary, uh, or li literacy rather, literacy level in the Middle Ages and estimates vary from maybe 6% to as high as 10% were literate. So most people couldn't read a Bible. The only Bible they really had access to was to see those wonderful paintings uh, around the walls when they came to the cathedral. It's interesting that in addition to cathedrals, you also had private chapels you know, somebody that was wealthy enough to have their own castle would certainly include a private chapel. And in that chapel, there would be paintings and altarpieces. And today, when we go to museums and we see that art that came from chapels and altarpieces and churches, we're seeing it in a very different context in a secular museum from what it was in its original religious setting. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Now, when an artist creates a scene from the Bible, what's really their point? Are they trying to show us what this scene really looked like and what these people really looked like? No, probably not, uh, because no one today knows what any of the people in the Bible looked like. We have almost no physical descriptions of people other than, you know, maybe Absalom had long hair or Saul was taller than everybody else, but we don't really have physical descriptions of what people look like. Even from the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who's one of the you know, better known characters in the Bible. There are no physical descriptions of what Paul looked like until at least a century after his death. So when we see these paintings, it's not that we're going to see what they actually look like. And let me show you one example to illustrate that. This is a marvelous, just fantastic painting uh, by John Martin. He was an English artist in the early 1800s, uh, sort of the uh, Romantic period. He paints these fantastic scenes. Uh, usually the people are very small and the landscape is uh, overwhelming, and that's certainly the case here. Uh, the, the title of this, as you can see, is uh, Joshua Commands the Sun to Stand Still, and that's from uh, a passage in the book of Joshua where they're fighting to gain entry into Canaan and Joshua speaks and the sun stands still so they can finish the battle. Was Mark, now I'm, I hate that it's so light in here, it's hard for you to see the details in these, I, I know. Uh, but uh, you can see down here Joshua and his army and up here, sort of fading into the mist of these fantastic crags and mountain peaks. And then over here, you have this enormous fortress city. Well, I've been to Israel a number of times, and I can assure you there are no mountains in Israel that look like that. I worked on an archaeological dig. I can tell you there were no cities 
that look like those marvelous fortresses that you see in this painting. So I don't think Martin is giving us what it really looked like. Maybe he's trying to uh, inspire us by, by uh, helping us think about the faith and the courage that people would have had when they faced the obstacles that they faced. Is that going to make it a little darker? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, thank you. So it's not about what people really look like. And when you see some of these paintings, you'll see sometimes people dressed uh, in medieval costumes, uh, women in Renaissance dresses, and it's not because the artists didn't know any better. Sometimes it's because they thought people would identify with these characters better if they were dressed the way people were familiar with, uh, with seeing people dressed at that time. Um, so uh, we'll sort of keep that in mind as we look at some of these. But art was intended as an aid to devotion and faith. Uh, it was to encourage virtues like courage and trust and faith. Art, just like literature, can be a pathway to God, as, as the quote uh, Hester mentioned pointed out. I found another quote from Sister Wendy Beckett, who said, art is one way of listening to God. Uh, I think that is so, uh, so accurate. Sometimes scripture influences the artist in the way the artist presents a particular scene. But then in turn, sometimes art influences the way we might understand scripture. And we'll look at some examples of that. And some of you have probably heard Sandy and his famous uh, example of the painting by Caravaggio of the conversion of Saul, where Saul is struck on the road to Damascus and falls off his horse. Well, of course, in the Bible, there's no mention of a horse. We don't know if he was riding a horse or walking. Uh, it might well be that he was walking. But Caravaggio puts a horse in. And so now, many times now when we think of that scene, we think of the horse, which is not even mentioned in Scripture. And, and other artists have done the same thing. And next week uh, we'll look at some New Testament scenes and maybe... Uh, Think about that a bit more. Uh, it's interesting that even in Scripture, there are references to art when, for example, they were building the tabernacle, you know, that movable tent where they worshipped uh, before they built the temple. And as they were building that, God says in Exodus 31, the Lord spoke to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and have filled him with divine spirit, with ability, intelligence, knowledge of every kind of craft to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze. So even at the building of the tabernacle, they were not just concerned with it being utilitarian, but also with it being beautiful and artistic. So uh, that was included there as well. Now, sometimes art can have more than one purpose. And uh, this is a great example of that. Uh, I first saw a copy of this at the Ringling Museum in Sarasota, Florida. It's this huge painting that's about the size of that screen, it fills a whole wall. And uh, Rubens lived during the time of the Catholic Counter-Reformation, uh, 60, early 1600s. Uh, he was Catholic, and this is one of a series of four paintings that he did that he calls the Defenders of the Eucharist. Well, the scene is Abraham here on the left with his soldiers, his uh, followers, 
and they are meeting Melchizedek. And the passage in Scripture that refers to this is on your uh, handout there, on your, on your table or on, on a chair nearby, from uh, Genesis 14. And Abraham is coming back from defeating these uh, Canaanite forces. And the key phrase here is, Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram or Abraham. Now, people saw that phrase, bread and wine, and what do you think that made them think of? Do we, do we know anything about bread and wine? The Eucharist, of course. And so they thought of the Eucharist in the context of this story. And at the time of the Counter-Reformation, there was a conflict uh, between, of course, Catholics and Protestants, but also one of, the, one of the issues was who is the authority? Is it the church? Is it the secular authority, the kings, the nobility? Who's really in control? And, of course, the Catholic point of view was that the church was the ultimate authority. And one of the ways they showed that authority is by controlling the Eucharist. Who can offer the Eucharist? Uh, who's in fellowship that can receive the Eucharist? And so that was extremely important. Well, in this scene, Rubens is showing... Melchizedek offering the bread and wine, and who's standing just a little bit higher? It's Melchizedek, isn't it? The representative of the church, the one who's offering the Eucharist. He's a little higher. Abraham, whoops, we just lost something. I don't know how that... Okay. Um, while she's getting the picture back... I'll point out, here we go, thank you. Uh, Abraham, notice he's almost kneeling before Melchizedek as he receives the bread. And, oh, okay. And uh, if you, I know it's hard to see in this light, uh, but Look at the way Melchizedek is dressed, this beautiful golden robe that he has on. It looks like the robe that somebody might wear. In fact, we've seen robes like that in the last few weeks, haven't we? Of course, the celebrant often wears a robe, but the bishop, when the bishop was here, had a beautiful robe like that. So uh, Melchizedek is dressed like a priest or a bishop. And the, his, his, uh, his uh, helpers are dressed the same way. And so clearly Rubens is saying something about who's in charge. Even the horse over here is kneeling toward Melchizedek. So it's not just about the story in Genesis 14, but it's also about the whole political conflict that's going on. And Rubens is using this to make a point uh, about that. Now, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I taught college students for a long, long time. And so I'm used to questions. If you have a question that occurs, please feel free to bring it up. That won't bother me at all. Uh, so if you think of something along the way or at the end and you want to ask about it, Please feel free to do that. Well, yes. That the side that Melchizedek is on is brighter and lighter. Exactly, exactly. This side is brighter. This side is a little bit darker. Again, that sort of co contributes to that idea of who's more important, who's in charge. Exactly. Good observation. All right. Well, what I would like to do for the rest of our time this morning is to look at some examples 
of a few key scenes from the Old Testament and see how different artists have presented those. Um, and I'm going to take one scene that's pretty well known and then two that are probably not as well known and see how artists have done them. And we'll be looking at only three or four examples of each one. If you were to Google one of these on the internet, you could find many, many more paintings uh, of each one of these. Uh, so I've just selected a few that, that will help us, I think, to think about this just a little bit today. So the first one is the story of Abraham offering Isaac. And uh, you have the key passage there from Genesis 22. Uh, and I want us to think about this uh, for, for just a minute. Uh, it's referred to as Abraham sacrificing Isaac or sometimes Abraham offering Isaac. Our Jewish neighbors refer to it as Abraham binding Isaac. Uh, because they say, well, after he wasn't sacrificed, but he was bound and laid on the wood. So they'd call it the binding of Isaac. Uh, but they're all talking about the same, the same story. Now, this first one is by uh, the Italian artist uh, Tipolo. Uh, and you see his dates there, late 1600s and the 1700s. This particular work is on the ceiling of a palace in uh, northeastern Italy. And because it's on a ceiling, you know, people are standing on the floor, they have to look way up, and it's high, high above them. It has to be simple and clearly recognizable. Can't put a lot of fussy details in because you wouldn't be able to see them from that distance. So it's a simple uh, ar arrangement. The colors are light and bright, and that's kind of interesting because this is a pretty dark story about Isaac almost being killed, but the colors are very bright and light in spite of the dark story itself. Now, over here, of course, on the left, we see the dramatic figure of Abraham. He has the knife raised in his hand just about to slay his son. Uh, there's Isaac bound on the wood. Over here we have the angel descending on this cloud of storm and the robe of the angel is sort of billowing up giving a sense of very dramatic movement. So the wind is blowing the cloud, the robe is billowing and just at the last instant, just before Abraham is about to plunge the knife, his eyes and the angel's eyes lock, and he stopped. He's frozen in, in midair or, or mid-strike. And, of course, here we have this light shining down from the clouds, uh, opening the way, and that represents God in heaven looking down on this scene. And it's interesting that the angel is at quite a distance here. And so it's the sound and the voice that stops Abraham. But the angel is not actually physically there to stop him. Now that's different because in some of the paintings we'll see in just a minute, the angel is in a very different place. Oh, is it again? Oh, is that? Can you go? Up, can you go up here in my Wi-Fi stuff and turn it off? Sorry about that. Pardon? No, that's my computer. And it's, look, it's looking for Wi Fi, is what it's doing, and I don't know why. I'm just going to sit right here. And I'll okay, it out all right, that's fine. All right, well, let's look at the next one. 
This is by uh, Gregorio Lanzarini, and he's just a little bit earlier than Tipolo. In fact, he was actually Tipolo's teacher. Uh, but he also does a scene of the binding of Isaac. And a couple of interesting things here. Look at the figure of Isaac. Does that look like a 10 or 12 year old? It looks like a grown man, doesn't it? A very strong, muscular guy who probably could resist being bound on an altar if he wanted to. But maybe it suggests he willingly allows his father to bind him. And the father, wow, this is blurry, isn't it? I don't know why that's so blurry, but uh, the father, Abraham, According to the text, he's well over 100. He, in this painting, he looks pretty good for 100, doesn't he? He doesn't look quite that old, and he looks pretty strong, doesn't he, for being 100. But the fascinating thing to me about this one is the position of the angel. He's, the angel has actually put himself between Abraham and Isaac to stop any possibility of this sacrifice actually being carried out. Uh, so that, I think, is, is significant. And again, it's really hard to see in this painting, but there down in the corner is the head of the ram that's going to take the place of Isaac. So quite a different uh, scene from the one that we saw earlier. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is maybe one of the most famous uh, paintings of this particular scene, and that is the one by Rembrandt. Uh, notice Rembrandt uses a technique called chiaroscuro. That means a lot of the painting is dark, and there are a few key parts that are much brighter and lighter. And notice... Abraham's robe and most of the background is very dark because it's not really important. The lighter parts are, of course, Abraham's face and the hands of the angel. And here the angel is actually grabbing Abraham's arm so that he can't offer the sacrifice. And it's Again, it's unfortunate that it's hard to see, but look right there is the knife caught in midair. It's fallen out of Abraham's hand. And so we see the very instant when the sacrifice is stopped and the angel grabs his hand and the knife is dropping out, but the knife is, is still pointing. It's pointing toward... Isaac's throat. So it's clearly pointing, you know, that this is who this, this is the one that was going to be the sacrifice. And look how bright Isaac's body is, lighter than everything else in the painting, to highlight the sacrifice. And some have suggested that, that Rembrandt is drawing a parallel between the sacrifice of Isaac or, or near sacrifice of Isaac and the sacrifice of Christ, uh, that he's, you know, the, this perfect figure, this perfect young man, sort of representing the perfect sacrifice of Christ, uh, that he's innocent, he's about to be, notice this knife, again, it's really hard to see, but the knife has a very rounded end. It's not a pointed knife for stabbing or piercing. It's a knife that you would use to draw across the throat to shed the blood of the sacrifice, just like Christ's blood was sacrificed. So there's a lot of symbolism here that Rembrandt is using. Now the angel grabs his hand with his right hand, but with the angel's left hand, he has it raised. Not, I think, to strike Abraham, but raised in blessing to Abraham. So Abraham is being blessed because 
of his faith. And then look at Abraham. One hand held the knife that has just dropped here in midair. And on the other hand, look, he's put it over the face of Isaac. And some have suggested the hand is even, you know, too large because it's emphasizing covering Isaac's face. And why is he doing that? Uh, is it because he doesn't want to look on the face of his son as he's about to carry out this sacrifice? Is, he, is it because he doesn't want his son to see the knife and see what's about to happen? Uh, we're not sure. Uh, and he's, he's bearing his neck so that he can offer his son as God told him to do. But the angel stops him at the last minute. So again, Rembrandt is probably using this not just as a representation of Genesis 22, but also as uh, an allegory of the sacrifice of Christ. Questions at this point? All right, well, let's look at another one. And this one, it, it's a, a French uh, artist uh, from a little bit later, 1700s. And the thing I think is interesting about this is we're, again, a little bit later in the development of the scene. The sacrifice is over at this point. Where is the knife? And again, I apologize that you can't see, but the knife is actually on the ground here. It's harmless now. The danger is past. The angel is hovering here in the air, one hand raised, the other sort of stretching out toward Abraham and Isaac as if to say, here's your son. You know, he's yours. He's been spared. And the face of Abraham as he clutches his son Isaac to him, his face reflects joy and relief that his son is spared. Now, the Bible and the text you have there in front of you doesn't say anything about what their response was after the sacrifice was over. So the artist here is giving us a little insight into his idea what would have happened when the sacrifice was over? What would the reaction of the father be in? And there are all kinds of traditions about that, but the artist here presents what I think would be a normal response of relief and joy and happiness that your son is safe. And so that's what we see uh, in this painting. All right? Now, I wanted to show you this one for a couple of reasons. One, most of the things we've seen were, were very early, were uh, Reformation, Renaissance. I wanted to show you that people were still doing uh, paintings of uh, religious scenes. And here's Marc Chagall, a um, modern artist. This was done in 1966. And very bright, bold, primary colors. Here's Abraham in red with the knife. Here's Isaac in yellow. And then it's a little hard to see, but there's a lady here in the background. Maybe that's Sarah. There's the, the ram. And then we actually have two angels here. There's one up here in white and one here in blue. And it's not clear whether there are two angels or whether it was one angel that, you know, is sort of in, in uh, split time in one place and then in the next moment in a different place. And then, really fascinating, is back here you have the cross and the crucifixion of Christ going on back here in the background. So it's pretty clear he's using those two to interpret each other. As I was reading a bit about this, it also said that the figure of Isaac and his sacrifice is viewed in different ways in modern Israel. Sometimes Isaac is portrayed as the young Israeli soldiers who are 
offering their lives to save the state or, or sometimes even the state of Israel that is threatened with destruction by their neighbors. So in modern Israel, they would see this story from Genesis 22 in, in other ways uh, that we might not immediately think of. Questions about the sacrifice of Isaac? And as I said, there are many, many more that we could look at. Yes, Sandy. Well, uh, I mean, obviously you have that very striking difference between the two stories. Uh, but I think uh, people reading the Old Testament would sort of look for ways, look for parallels. And with Isaac, you've got, you know, the, the young man, the perfect body, uh, not resisting allowing himself to be sacrificed. You have all those kind of parallels. Now, the parallel doesn't hold all the way to the end, but I think there are enough things there that suggested this to the mind of a lot of people reading that. That makes sense? All right. Well, I want to move from this one to a story that's maybe not quite as well known, and that is the story of uh, the, the uh, bronze serpent that's raised in the wilderness. And again, you have the text there from uh, Numbers 21. It's a very short story and one that we don't spend a lot of time on, but it's very fascinating to me that uh, many, many different artists have chosen to uh, paint this particular scene. Now, in this one, you have a number of people that are already uh, bitten. Uh, some are sick or, or uh, dying. Others, you know, are turning, looking toward this bronze serpent. Moses here in the center has raised it on a pole. And here in the background is a, is a sort of a golden light. And it's not clear, is that, is that a sunset? Sort of a dark scene of death for those that are turning away from God or complaining? Or is it a sunrise and hope for those who are looking to the serpent in faith? So uh, it's sort of open to interpretation there. Now, the next one, here you have one figure already on the ground. There's another figure over here sort of writhing in agony. He reminds me a little bit of some of those figures that you see in the Last Judgment of the souls being pulled down by the demons of the underworld. It's sort of the way this figure is, is uh, looking. But the fascinating thing about this, I think, is look at the shape of the pole. Does that remind you of anything? Looks a lot like the cross, doesn't it? And in the New Testament, this is even referred to uh, in the Gospel of John about Jesus being lifted up on the cross just like the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. So here the artist is clearly uh, drawing on that parallel. Now, in the next one by Giordano, another Italian artist, look here at how prominent the cross is. The cross has become the dominant feature. And the serpent, you can barely see. You have to really look carefully. The serpent is quite small wrapped around this, and the cross is really the dominant feature. And you could read all kinds of symbolism here. The hill, they have to go up the hill to the cross. Is that Calvary? Uh, you have, again, this marvelous golden light directly behind the cross, the presence of God. And if they look to the cross in faith, if they look at this bronze serpent in faith, they will be delivered. And uh, Moses here, very prominent at the foot of the pole, sort of pointing to it as 
Moses, the symbol of the Old Testament, pointing ahead to the cross and the New Testament. So again, lots of symbolism going on here in this one. And then uh, one more, and this one is later, as you can see, 1898. Uh, I wanted again to show you that people didn't stop doing this in the Renaissance, but have continued to look at these scenes. Uh, John was an English artist, uh, well known for uh, his sort of post-impressionist style. And you see that here with this kind of soft focus of the post-impressionists. Uh, he was also well known for painting portraits of some famous people in England. You probably have seen somewhere his portrait of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, dressed in all his Arabian robes and his headdress on. And uh, John is the one who did that. Uh, but I thought this was interesting that he also did religious scenes like this. And then this last one, and this is from a, a, a book of hours that's in the Morgan Library. And notice they have on facing pages Christ on the cross and the serpent on the pole in the wilderness. So clearly they're telling us that we can interpret those two in light of each other. When we think about that serpent on the pole, we should think of Christ on the cross. So they put them side by side. Yes? Where is the Morgan Library? Uh, it's in New York, isn't it? There you go. Okay, so, so a familiar spot. There you go. All right, excellent. Now, the last one I want us to look at is the judgment of Solomon. But before we get to the judgment of Solomon, we have to think about what leads up to that. If we were, if we were studying the book of Kings, and we don't have time for that this morning, but we could look at the fact that Solomon comes to power, uh, he eliminates his rivals, he's consolidated on his throne, and then there is this marvelous scene where he has this dream, and God appears to him in a dream and says, I will give you whatever you want. What, what do you ask for? And Solomon doesn't ask for wealth, he doesn't ask for power, but he asks for wisdom to be able to, to govern this people wisely. And in this scene, you have a combination of sort of pre-Christian symbols and Christian or biblical symbols. Uh, over here, and it's really hard to see, but you have this woman who represents Minerva, the Roman goddess of wisdom. And right beside her is a lamb sitting on a book. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? So you've got pre-Christian wisdom, but then you've also got Christ and the Bible represented here. Solomon, this almost looks like an uh, Adonis, Apollo kind of young Greek uh, hero lying on the bed. The bed is made of gold, of course. What else would Solomon have? He has a bed of gold, and there's a figure on the head, and then there's another figure that's really hard to see, but another little figure down here at the foot. There's his crown laying right beside him. And then over here, you've got the angels, the heavenly host, descending out of the clouds, and God right at the center, and the heavenly hosts are even, they're sort of hiding their eyes from the presence of God. Uh, they're, they're overwhelmed by this. And then God, this uh, marvelous figure, and notice there's this bright light coming from God, representing the wisdom descending on Solomon. 
Uh, so, uh, again, you may have seen this as a pretty well-known uh, painting in a, in a sort of a late Baroque style, uh, dark, but Solomon highlighted here on his, on his bed. All right, questions? Well, that's the background for the judgment. And the reason I say it's the background is because in the text, this story comes first about the dream and God giving him wisdom. And then immediately following that is the story about the two women who come to bring the children and ask for a judgment. And Solomon makes this wonderful judgment. So that story serves as a kind of an illustration that yes, indeed, he really did get wisdom from God. And here's the proof. So I think those two stories are put side by side for a reason. Now, here is probably one of the best known paintings of the judgment. Uh, you see Solomon sitting majestically on his throne in the background, sort of neutral. His hands are just sort of at his side as if he's, he's listening, he's watching to see what is going to happen. You've got one group of figures over here, and one of them is sort of turning away as if I can't bear to watch what's about to happen Here's one mother, and if you could see her face, her face looks very angry. She's accusing, she's pointing at the other mother as she's holding the dead child in one arm. The other mother isn't even looking at the accuser. She's looking at Solomon, pleading her case. And of course, over here, we see the soldier He's drawing his sword about to carry out the, the command of Solomon. And so we're at the point where Solomon, I think, is sort of looking for clues. He's, he's waiting to see how he can decide. So we're sort of caught at that moment when things are still up in the air. It's just about to come to a conclusion, but we're not quite there yet. Now this one, as I read this, I see this as maybe just a little earlier in the, in the uh, setting. Notice on the, on the right, the face of this mother, very detached, very cold. Uh, the mother on the left, clutching her child and Solomon, again, sort of watching. And the soldier, he really hasn't drawn his sword. He has his hand on his sword, and he has one hand on the mother's shoulder, but he hasn't really done anything yet. He's, he's about to. So we're seeing the scene just before things get to the crucial point. And then here, wow, the most dramatic of all of them. You see... Uh, these figures over here are all looking this direction. Look at the angle of this mother's body. Her, even her body is sort of pointing this way. The child's body angling over here. And the mother, this mother, one arm here, one arm up here. So again, sort of leads our eye. Everything, even Solomon's arm, everything in the painting leads us over here to this crucial point. And I mean, the sword is raised. It is just about to come down. So this is the dramatic moment. And Solomon says, stop. So I mean, he catches it just at the last moment. But I think it's fascinating how everything leads us to look at this dramatic point in the painting. And then the last one and again, this sort of takes us beyond what Scripture tells us. What was the reaction of people after the judgment was made? Well, everybody marveled at Solomon's great wisdom, but what was the reaction of the mothers? Well, we see one desolate, decimated uh, here on the floor, weeping over the dead child. This mother clutching the living child and rushing away 
before anything else can happen. And Solomon, sort of bathed in this golden divine light, his wisdom has been demonstrated, and here he is uh, at the conclusion of this judgment scene. Well, so uh, those are the ones that I picked for us to look at today. Uh, questions about any of these? Or, uh, uh, as I said, the art is fascinating, but I, I hope it also will help us maybe to think a little bit more about some of these stories and what they might say to us, uh, maybe help us in our own meditation, our own devotions. I think art can do that, and anybody can go on the Internet now, and that's a marvelous thing that we have available to us now. Anybody can go on the Internet and find wonderful examples of things like this. Questions? Yes. Right, that's true, because now we have access to the written text, and this can be a supplement where you're exactly right. Centuries ago, this would have been their primary source of information. As I was in the nave last week, I was looking at those marvelous spaces. You know, we have those arches on the side, and then there's those spaces above the arches. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could fill all those with these wonderful paintings like this that we could look at? But I'm not sure that's in the budget, but, you know... <laughs> Just a thought. Yes, sir. When we try to read into these what we think the artists are trying to do, what they were trying to convey to me? Uh, occasionally there are things like that, but very often not. Uh, so very often it's left to the interpreter. Uh, there's a marvelous quote from uh, who's the dancer that you've quoted? Uh, uh, Isidore Duncan. Duncan, who has a quote. Someone asked her if she could explain what she was trying to say with this dance. And she said, if I could explain it in words, I wouldn't have to dance it. <laughs> well, the artists sometimes, if they could put it in words, they wouldn't have to paint it, you know, so they'd leave it up to us. And, and even, even when we read the text in the Bible, Sometimes we still have to interpret. It doesn't always clarify everything. So there's always some of that involved. But that, that's an interesting point. Other thoughts? Jesus is a, uh, the expression of that. Yeah, very good, very good observation. Well, next week, I want to look at a few examples from New Testament stories and then I also want to look at some examples that are not necessarily biblical, but art that still might have a religious theme or a message for us. So we'll look at some of those as well next time. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And come back.